sometimes to better understand the world's current situation of now, we must dig deep in the past, then zoom at the facts there, that logically answer the questions of today. This was the very first episode of the Computer Chronicles, broadcast back in 1983. When we first launched the series, sitting by my side as co-host was Gary Kildall. But Gary was a lot more than a TV host. Gary, in fact, was one of the most important individuals in the history of personal computing. Gary died last year, leaving a legacy not matched by many in this field. Today, we're going to devote the entire show to Gary Kildall, and his role in the development of the personal computer. On a residential block in the seaside town of Pacific Grove, California, sits a modest house with a grand history. Behind its garage in a small carriage house, one of the seminal events in personal computing history took place first modern operating system for the microcomputer was born here over 20 years ago. It was called CPM, and its inventor was a young computer science teacher named Gary Kildall. Kildall had started developing his control program for microcomputers, also known as control program monitor, in the early 1970s when he realized the potential for a general purpose small computer. He was carrying a portable computer at a time when the desktop PC was just a dream. I met Gary in 1973 in the computer science lab late one evening. He was a uh, young kid, freckled, reddish hair, uh, boyish enthusiasm, was in cutoffs, came into the computer center with a leather brief briefcase that he flipped open and connected to a teletype, an ASR33. And that was an entire self-contained computer. It was the first personal computer I ever saw. And I went wild. I wanted to know where he got it, how he got it, what he was doing with it, how I could get one. Gary studied computer science at the University of Washington and went on to obtain a doctorate. He soon moved to the Naval Postgraduate School in Monterey, where he later became a professor. In the 1970s, the seeds of CPM were planted during his teaching career at Monterey. He continued to work on the project at home and later in this tiny rooftop office above a restaurant in Pacific Grove. The first thing I, I heard of, that, that Gary did that was really brought to my attention was he he'd invented a programming language called PLM and implemented it for the Intel microprocessors to prove that, that the 8088 was, or the 8080, I'm sorry, was a real computer and not a controller for, for microwave ovens, but that it was a real computer. And he went off and, and, and wrote a programming language that ran on microcomputers. Now we can say, well, well, of course that's no big deal, but at the time it was a pretty big deal. He, he invented this language, and then to show that the language was useful, he wrote CPM. That's what really actually happened. He created this operating system and, and built it around this Intel microprocessor to show what could be done with microprocessors. And in 1975, when he was doing this, that was pretty revolutionary. Gary's approach to computing was far ahead of the conventional notions of the time. While a consultant at Intel in the 70s, he offered to sell them CPM, but Intel could see no use for it and turned him down. Shortly afterwards, in 1976, Gary and his wife Dorothy founded a company called Intergalactic Digital Research, later shortened to Digital Research in an old Victorian home. In the early days, Digital Research Incorporated, or DRI, was CPM. While the operating system is just a dim memory in most PC users' minds today, its role in the development of the microcomputer was pivotal. What's so important about the work that Gary did was the fact that he was one of the first to introduce uh, an operating system for personal computers that began laying the groundwork that basically all other personal computer operating systems, hardware design, and applications can take their roots from. The main thing that CPM brought that was different from how anybody else was approaching microcomputers was that Gary made a logical separation of the physical I.O. system from what was called the BDOS. The physical I.O. system was called the BIOS, the basic I.O. system, and that was a term that Gary used in early CPM. 
The BDOS was a basic disk operating system. The BDOS was independent of the specific hardware that you had in your microcomputer. By comparison, and we were looking at the time of, uh, of Unix being out as a major mini computer operating system, and you could not move executables of any application programs from one Unix machine, unless it was an identical machine, to another system. So this was really a remarkable innovation. CPM sold extremely well and DRI flourished. The company expanded to larger quarters across the street. The number of employees grew from 9 to 24. When a new VAX mini computer arrived, it was too large to fit inside the building. So the entire structure was lifted off its foundation to accommodate the machine. A beaming Gary told the staff they would all be getting a raise that week. It was a time of skyrocketing growth. By August of 1982, the company newsletter reported that DRI's revenues had grown over 1,000% in the past two years. DRI now had 200 employees. CPM was established as the industry standard and the most popular 8-bit operating system in the world. When the computer industry was just starting up, there was, there was the computer industry. There was IBM and the Seven Dwarves and, and the, the, the mainframe industry dominated by, by glass houses and, 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 and giant mainframe computers. It cost millions and millions of dollars. And, and the, the personal computer industry did not descend genealogically from that uh, gene pool. It sprung up in a completely separate way, in a completely separate place. And Gary was its spiritual leader. He, his company was the biggest and most successful of all of the companies. And all of the companies were modeled after Gary's. Gary was a very busy guy. He was chairman of a large company. He was personally involved in new product development. Yet every two weeks, he would spend four hours driving up and down this Pacific Coast Highway to spend a day in front of the cameras. When we come back, Gary's new role as a television host. With DRI's business growing, Gary went on to other pursuits, including the role of co-host on Computer Chronicles. His second career as television host lasted over six years, during which he provided acute insights into the technology and potential of hundreds of products. While appearing on the program, he also showed off products and technologies of his own that were far ahead of the market, including a multitasking operating system for PCs called Concurrent DOS. Um, what's even more interesting is that all is not quite as it appears because, in fact, if you uh, press a little key here, you actually see that there are lots and lots of processes actually running, lots of tasks running here. And, in fact, on these serial terminals even themselves, I can hit a key on this one, for example, and find that uh, I'm running DBase 3 at the mm -hmm. same time. So what we're seeing here is the ability of the IBM PS2 Model 80 as a 386-based machine um, in conjunction with concurrent DOS 386, its ability to run both standard DOS applications, because the operating system is completely DOS compatible, but to be able to run multiple DOS applications and to allow shared access to them. DRI also had one of the first graphical user interfaces right called GEM. I'll open up a pre-prepared uh, graph and we'll see what the combination of text and graphics look like. I'm going to go to a full scale full screen here you can see uh -huh. here's the final result of putting it together text with graphics and I'll just go ahead and send this to the output device and in this case we're going to just use a screen but it could be a slide uh, maker or a um, Oh, uh, over a transparency uh -huh. maker, whatever it happens to be. And that, that well, I think that his interest was in, um, first of all, showing that digital research was still the leader um, and not, um, in, and that we had, since graphical environments were sort of becoming hot, if you will, and, uh, you know, the Lisa hadn't really been successful, but word on the street was, you know, Macintosh is coming, and, and the fact that he could go and show a multitasking graphical-oriented environment um, running as a digital research project that no one knew at all that we were even working on. I think he appreciated the kind of surprise factor of that. And, uh, and he's, I remember him coming back and saying that, um, you know, Bill Gates and other people were at this uh, conference that Esther Dyson had, and they were like, eyes were like glued to the screen trying to, you know, see what, what that was going on. So 
I think we put some fear in Microsoft, and I think Gary liked that. Gary's pleasure at beating everyone to the starting gate with new ideas may have been personally satisfying, but it was also risky. By revealing DRI projects, he was also divulging information that could be appropriated by other companies. And this created a unique ethical situation for Gary and his chief competitor. I really believe that on the scale of 1 to 10, 10 being ethical, Bill Gates is about a 9. I think that there are some other corporate presidents out there that are about the threes and the fours. I, 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 don't, I don't want to be an apologist for Bill Gates, but, but I'm saying that Gary is just on a different scale. His ethics is a different scale. And what happened is, is Bill used his ethical scale, which was a darn good one. And Gary used his ethical scale, which is a darn good one. Now, the ethics of a businessman are generally one that is that's very, very competitive. And the ethics of, of an academician, although they're certainly competitive, involves a, a much greater degree of cooperation. And so Gary always cooperated. He always said, well, Bill, here's what we're working on. And Bill always said, <laughs> well, that guy sure was a kind of a dummy. He just told me what he's working on. I don't think Gary was a, really a, a driven to be a businessman. Um, Gary was driven to create things. and. Uh, uh, he always, every time I talked to him, he had some really great ideas of things he was going to do or things that could be done or things he was working on or new technologies and how he might apply them. That was Gary. This is a beta copy of the very first electronic encyclopedia using optical storage technology. Gary gave it to me one day when we were taping a show in the studio in that building over there. Gary had to use a video disc because CD-ROM technology was not yet widely available. He was very proud of this. This was the first product of his new interactive company, then called ActiVenture. In 1985, Gary showed the very first encyclopedia on a CD-ROM, a project that grew out of his fascination with early video discs. The Grolier Academic American Encyclopedia had many features that are commonplace today, including hypertext links, a full text search engine, and a traditional bookshelf interface. This is the one we need to select, and it's working its way down through the volume here, giving us finer and finer divisions. And finally, we go down and find the article titles, and here they are just as if we were thumbing through that section of the encyclopedia, and we can point to the title okay. we wish to examine. So you're just pulling out that article now. That's right, and here it is, there the, is. the exploits of Raul Amundsen. In this point, you can page back and forth, take a look at uh -huh. the article, uh -huh. things of that sort. Now, that's all in the CD-ROM that's in this player right here. And, and what, what's the amount of storage involved? How much? Uh, what's well, the this is 550 megabytes, uh, uh, half a billion bytes of information, enough to stretch uh, 10 characters per inch from uh, here to Denver. <laughs> <laughs> Gary's success also gave him time to pursue his love of life. He collected and raced sports cars. Experienced pilot, he owned several airplanes, and he never hesitated to fly to meetings across the state or across the country. I went out to visit uh, Gary, and uh, uh, we arranged to meet in the airport in San Jose. Uh, when uh, uh, I got to the airport, uh, he was flying his own private plane in. Uh, so. Uh, I was meeting him in the terminal for private planes. I went, looked around the airport, no Gary. Uh, or no, there wasn't anyone who looked like a software person wandering around this very small terminal. So I called the company and they said, oh, look for Gary. Uh, he'll have on cowboy boots and has a red beard. I knew I could find him then. And, um, and he still wasn't there. So I looked out the door, the window, and a plane came rolling up. and. Uh, this fellow with a red beard leaned out the red beard leaned out the window and said, "There aren't any parking places. Hop in." Gary flew his potential investor to a restaurant near Sacramento and proceeded to describe the future of the PC industry. At that time, um, he was trying to explain what his business was, and I had lunch, and he basically took a paper and outlined uh, the microcomputer industry to me. He explained how the operating system would ultimately control. Uh, the uh, uh, industry uh, and how application software would run on top of it and that an operating system company um, should support the applications companies but never have applications uh, which had turned out to be a fatal mistake and one of the fatal mistakes for the company. 
Even as Gary's financial success allowed him to accumulate bigger and faster toys, his contemporaries remember him as a man who just enjoyed having fun. Gary had that ability to be innovative. And yet he was, on the other hand, he was, had this amazing free spirit about him. Um, you know, he, Gary was certainly easy to talk into grabbing a six-pack of beer and going out to the lake and water ski. I mean, there was never a problem with that aspect of it either. He was a, a very, uh, very unusual and remarkable individual. The early days of the microcomputer industry created an exciting atmosphere that attracted adventurous entrepreneurs to the PC pioneers working outside of the mainstream mainframe computer world made it more risky but more satisfying. There were very, very few people in those first years who came into the computer industry, it came into the microcomputer industry from the real computer industry. The attitude that, that pervaded Silicon Valley in 1980 was, when are the grown-ups going to come in here and make us stop? That was really what it felt like. Because we could do things that we could do whatever we wanted. CPM's role as the standard operating system for personal computers was not to last very long. When we come back, the battle between CPM and MS-DOS and the true story of what happened with IBM and Bill Gates. Despite his varied talents and accomplishments, Gary Kildall was perhaps best known as the man who chose to go flying on the day IBM came calling. It was the event which dogged him his entire life and it has become a legend in personal computer history. But his friends and co-workers alike agree that the story is mostly myth and that the facts are very different. Gary and I were scheduled to go that morning up to meet with Bill Godbout, who was one of the early people in the microcomputer industry building an S100 system, and we were delivering him uh, CPM documentation. So Gary and I, as the story goes, were in fact flying. We flew up to the Bay Area, up to the Oakland Airport, delivered the software to Bill, and uh, flew back down and joined the IBM meeting. We were there for the meeting later in the afternoon. By that point in time, things had already gone a little bit wrong. Um, IBM had come into the meeting. They had a, uh, what I would call a unidirectional uh, non-disclosure agreement. The idea was that uh, digital research was to agree that they had never met IBM and, and the meeting hadn't occurred. And yet everything that digital research disclosed to IBM was intended to be public domain. That was uh, the way the agreement was structured. IBM also wanted to buy CPM outright for a flat fee and rename it PC-DOS, terms that were unacceptable to DRI. IBM then approached Microsoft and tried to license its clone of CPM called QDOS. When IBM discovered that it might be facing a copyright lawsuit, they returned to DRI and struck a deal. DRI agreed to let IBM sell both CPM and Microsoft DOS side by side and to let the market decide which was best, but the deck was stacked. I can only tell you that we were quite shocked to see that the price for PC DOS was $40 and the price for CPM 86 was 240 We were given no indication at all whatsoever until it was actually rolled out that they were going to do a six to one price difference. So in fact, um, IBM did let the market decide. It was pretty hard to imagine that uh, somebody could justify buying CPM 86, which had very similar functionality to PC-DOS uh, when there was a six to one price difference. Some industry people have pointed to this incident as a turning point in PC history, and the moment that guaranteed the demise of CPM and the rise of MS-DOS. Others have pointed out that it somehow changed Gary professionally and personally. The frustration that I think more and more frustrated and to a degree I have to be honest about embittered him some um, in later years was the fact that he continually had this comparison thrust on him. That uh, anytime he would uh, have an interview or meet uh, a company uh, in a business context there were the frequent questions, did you really go flying when IBM came to visit? What, you know, what really happened? So that would frequently be asked. And that was always a frustration because Gary was a person that I think was very proud of his achievements, of the fact that he actually um, was instrumental 
in building this open architecture that we have in the industry. I think Gary's view was that uh, what happened happened. I think he, if anything, regretted that people didn't appreciate the contributions he made. I think all people who are really driven to, to do something and who are very bright spend some time wondering about the ones that got away. But I think of all the people I've known in business, Gary worried the least about the ones that got away. DRI's loss of the IBM contract was Microsoft's gain and the beginning of Microsoft's ascent to software stardom. But the reasons for IBM's decisions are still fuzzy and subject to different interpretations. I think what really changed the perspective from IBM's standpoint had to do with the fact that when Gates got involved, he basically said, look, we'll do whatever you need. We'll put energy, we'll put people, we'll work as hard as we can to make this happen. As opposed to the way Gary Kildell and his folks looked at it, which was, oh, here's another project. Remember, Kildell had already reached a certain level of uh, success at that point, where at this particular time, Gates and the folks at Microsoft were in their very early stages. But I think that there's also some, I don't think blame's exactly the right word, but some responsibility goes to the customers as well. Because uh, if IBM had, um, had not put all of their eggs in the Microsoft basket, they wouldn't be, have the problem that they do today, trying to sell Warp against you know, an OS2 against uh, the monster that they kind of created. Whatever the reason, the competition between DRI and Microsoft seemed to become a personal battle between Gary Kildall and Bill Gates, at least in the public eye. Well, Gary always considered Bill Gates a very good friend. Uh, in those early days, they all uh, sat, uh, they all were very friendly with each other and cooperative. And certainly Bill Gates says today that he sent, or, uh, sent uh, IBM to, to DRI when they were looking for the operating system. Um, I was on a panel uh, that uh, Ben Rosen uh, put on for the Rosen Forum in those very early days. And um, Gary got up and talked about what his plans were for CPM and where the company was going and, and then made a comment. Uh, well, this is a very large market and there's room, there room, there's room for lots of companies. And Bill Gates interrupted and he said, no, there will only be one company. Gary Kildall's life cannot be summed up by any one incident. It was made up of many notable accomplishments and a constant desire to innovate. His numerous contributions to the PC industry are evident, if not always recognized. To those who knew him well, it was the delight of discovery and not the money that drove him. And I think that in his mind, what he was always looking for is what is it that he could get or do or create with the te technology that would be his big win? And that was elusive. And the fact, th the fact that it was elusive, I think, played very heavily on the way he lived his, the latter part of his life. Gary Kildall's untimely death in 1994 at the age of 52 was a reminder that the light of genius is transitory and fragile. To his many friends and associates, it was a warning that we should cherish our relationships while we can. He is among a very small group of people that helped change the world in the 70s. And I think another group of people have taken advantage of it uh, in the 80s and the 90s. And I'm sure that that will continue. But Gary made a difference. I think he knew he made a difference. And certainly the people who knew Gary knew he made a difference. I think at this point in time it would be a shame to have Gary forgotten as being a person that was instrumental to the growing of this, this whole industry itself. Gary was somebody that had an infectious enthusiasm. Um, if you go out in the industry and talk with associates that he worked with at a business level, knew Gary as a person that enjoyed um, enjoyed the warmth of human contact, that enjoyed going to parties, to, to be very personable. He was not somebody that restricted uh, his focus to, to just the decision makers and the people that were leading the businesses and whatever. He was somebody that had a, a breadth of interests and, and was a very, uh, very open person. So I think it would be a real loss if, if all that the industry remembers about Gary is he was the guy that was flying the day IBM came.
because he was a much, much more of a person and, and contributed a great deal to this industry. Gary did make a difference. He was a genius and a gentleman, a rare combination. Gary did make a lot of money, but he was driven by an honest desire to create new ideas that could expand the human potential. For the Computer Chronicles, I'm Stuart Chaffee. In 1993, the year before his untimely death, Gary wrote a draft of a memoir titled Computer Connections, People, Places, and Events in the Evolution of the Personal Computer Industry. He distributed bound copies to family and friends, with a note that it will go to print in final form early next year. It never did. The ownership of the manuscript was passed to his children, Scott and Kristen. The Computer History Museum holds it, and only the first 78 pages are made available for reading. The rest of the pages have never been revealed. Hopefully they still exist. And hopefully are not censured nor destroyed. Our father, Gary Kildall, was one of the founders of the personal computer industry, but you probably don't know his name. In this excerpt Gary writes about his vision for bringing the new microprocessors into homes and businesses. In 1974, he invented CPM, the first operating system that could run on these new desktop platforms. Soon after, he created the BIOS, which enabled CPM to easily interface with different computer hardware. CPM became the de facto standard personal computer operating system in these early days. For the next 20 years, Gary continued inventing and breaking ground on new technologies, such as the first commercially available CD-ROM, an encyclopedia, which provided a comprehensive source of desktop knowledge. Gary viewed computers as learning tools rather than profit engines. His career choices reflect a different definition of success, where innovation means sharing ideas, letting passion drive your work and making source code available for others to build upon. His work ethic during the 1970s resembles that of the open source community today. We have chosen to release only the first portion of his memoir. Unfortunately Gary's passion for life also manifested in a struggle with alcoholism, and we feel that the unpublished preface and later chapters do not reflect his true self. If you want to read more about events in his later life and the further development of CPM, They Made America by Harold Evans, Gail Buckland, and David Leffer has an excellent chapter on this topic. We hope you enjoyed this glimpse into the life of a man who was inventive, compassionate and loved life. Scott Kildall and Kristen Kildall. Why would the children of Gary not follow his will, to publish the book? Gary was a high-caliber scientist with the PhD degree in computer science. And he was a genius. Even if he would have any problem with alcohol, if that's really true, it obviously did not bother his extraordinary creation of the DOS and OS operating systems for PC, nor creation of digital encyclopedia on CD-ROM, nor multitasking softwares for PC, nor first text graphic interfaces, nor his creation of a home PBX system that integrated landline telephones with mobile phones, nor his many other genius innovations, and it didn't bother either his regular participation in the Computer Chronicles TV, educational series of episodes in the American TV. Same with the book, it didn't bother writing the book content neither. He wrote the book, it means there was a purpose to it, as there was a purpose to everything he created. Gary's children have never published his book. Why? Were they too afraid after their father's mysterious death? Or they had no choice? And why the world doesn't know about Gary Kildall who was the father of DOS system and who was far ahead of Bill Gates of Microsoft, and of IBM, in the microcomputer software industry. It's fun to sit at a terminal and let the code flow. It sounds strange, but it just comes out my brain. Once I'm started, I don't have to think about it. Ask Bill why the string in function 9 is terminated by a dollar sign. Ask him, because he can't answer, only I. No, that. To Bill's dismay, the Apple platform for application software was controlled by Apple computers, not Microsoft. That's a wild card for Bill. He needed to control the platform for his basic, and IBM was to provide him with that. I was always apprehensive of his business moves, as I found his manner too abrasive and deterministic. 
although he mostly carried a smile, through a discussion of any sort. The combination of Kildall, and Gates, could have been a killer deal in those days. I had the operating systems for the decade to come, and he had the opportunistic approach to garner business. But, our attitudes differed entirely. He is divisive. He is manipulative. He is a user. He has taken much from me and the industry. Gary held a university degree in mathematics, and a PhD degree in computer science. He was an extraordinary scientist, professor, businessman and he was the founder of DOS operating systems for personal computers. The 70s, 80s and 90s, were the times of evolutionary transition between mechanical calculation and digital computers. And Gary was a genius of those times. Besides his other inventions, Gary's main focus was creation of operating systems, for personal computers. His operating systems were to be applied to any hardware regardless of the PC model and with any Intel processor upgrade. Gary's earning was mainly based on royalties from his creations. And his business ethics were more sort of like an open source, to provide systems that are available to anyone, not centralized, not monopoly business. Regarding Bill Gates, on the other hand, Bill dropped out of Harvard University after just two years of studying mathematics and computer science. Bill Gates's parents were in banking business and his father knew the Rockefeller family. The Harvard University was founded by the Rockefeller family. Source, Wikipedia and Google Images. Bill Gates, a young smart business mind, he perceived a huge opportunity in Gary's business, and so Bill took advantage of it, to grow his own Microsoft company, in cooperation with IBM. Bill's business ethics were completely different from the ethics of Gary. Bill tended to centralize this business, and as we see today, Microsoft is kind of a global monopoly that owns many things under one umbrella. The Bill's cloned copies QDOS Quick Dirty Operating System versus Gary's original DOS Disk Operating System, called CPM, it was an unfair and dirty game. Microsoft bought out the clone QDOS from a copying source who did the mirror copy of Gary's DOS. Bill then introduced the clone as his own, and, in cooperation with IBM, they launched it on the market, giving it names, MS-DOS and PC-DOS. This clone made an incredible fortune for Microsoft and IBM. However, there was a serious legal copyrights issue from the digital research company of Gary, as obviously the MS-DOS was an exact copy of the Gary's intellectual property. To prove that fact, Gary, while programming his operating systems, he was inserting inside the program some special symbols, to mark the system as his intellectual property. For that reason, he was the only one who knew exactly where these symbols are input in the operating system program and why. IBM later proposed to Gary to sell through IBM, both, the Gary's DOS and the Bill's clone MS-DOS. But they tricked Gary, and launched it on the market with unfair prices 6 to 1. Obviously the Bill's clone was selling well, and the Gary's original DOS was not. But even afterwards, the Gary's operating system which was his true intellectual property, still remained in the air, as a legal issue unrevealed and unsolved. This situation was very problematic, probably uncomfortable for Microsoft and IBM, because in case of a lawsuit from Gary, it was probably a serious threat to their businesses, to their prestige and to the huge fortune they were making on it. Furthermore, Gary's manuscript computer connections, might have described this unfair business situation. Gary was going to publish the book in 1994. But suddenly, he died. On July 8, 1994, something happened to Gary Kildall. On Wikipedia we read that perhaps he fell at a Monterey, California, bike a bar and hit his head. Other various sources say that he fell from a chair, or fell down steps, or was assaulted, because he had walked into the Franklin Street Bar Grill wearing Harley Davidson leathers. The exact circumstances of the injury remain unclear. He supposedly checked in and out of the hospital twice, and died three days later at the community hospital of the Monterey Peninsula. An autopsy the next day did not conclusively determine a cause of his death. A CPM Usenet FAQ says he was concussed from the fall and died of a heart attack. The connection between the two are unclear. 
He is buried in Evergreen Washelli Memorial Park in North Seattle. And the truth is buried with him. Wikipedia cites several articles from the websites, funded by Bill Gates, as for example the Seattle Times. Therefore, they are not likely to be objective. In the book titled Barbarians led by Bill Gates, we read, by May of 1994, Gates' patience was growing so thin, that not even a public relations pro, like Pam Edstrom, could muzzle him. The book was composed by Pam Edstrom's daughter. Microsoft company has become a giant global provider of OS operating systems, with its global market share between 77% and 87%, has almost no competition to compare with, on its scale, in this area. Even Apple with Mac OS, or Google Chrome OS, or Linux, cannot compete. Microsoft, with its technologies and global multi-activities, is now present in almost every sector, in almost every computer or phone, that accompany our life, and most of it is based on operating systems. Just to mention some examples of Microsoft presence, Windows Operating System, MS Office 365, Word, Excel, PowerPoint, OneDrive, Skype, LinkedIn, Hotmail, Uber, Nokia, CNBC TV, Expedia, Outlook, Bing, Internet Search Engine, Servers, Technet, GitHub, Pay, Multi-Currency Digital Money via Skype, TransferWise, Money Without Borders, IoT Internet of Things, Industrial AI Platforms, Conversational AI, Cortana, 5G Networking Systems, Web-Based Health Information, and Hospital Information Systems Software. Data Protection, Xbox, Interactive Systems Online Video Games, Antivirus Software, Database and Public Clouds, Outsourcing and Call Center Services, Digital Graphics 3D, Telecommunications, VoIP Voice over IP, etc. etc. The list is long. Check it on Wikipedia, list of mergers and acquisitions by Microsoft. Bill Gates, besides the digital technologies, he represents philanthropy, non-profit activities in the health and education sectors, and through the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, supports, invests in and cooperates with many organizations on a global scale, one example is, Gavi, the Global Alliance for Vaccines and Immunizations Organization. As we notice, in recent years, the world's investments values in new technologies are significant. Perhaps, just one man only, like Bill Gates in this observation, no matter how talented he is, but, just one person, probably wouldn't be able to handle all his multi-activities on a global scale, on his own, without any global solid backup of financial liquidity, perhaps in billions or trillions of US dollars, and without any strong professional backup from groups of influence, whose perhaps global interests he could also represent. Maybe he would never grow that big without any backup, it is of course only a hypothetical supposition though, nevertheless, the idea seems kind of logic. Until 1994, during the times, when personal computers and systems were growing, Gary Kildall's digital research company, with its first operating system, its upgrades, and other innovations, was already known on the market of microcomputers, of personal computers. Bill Gates, born in 1955, was 13 years younger than Gary, born in 1942. In 1972, Bill founded Trafo Data Company with his friend Paul Allen and sold a primitive, rudimentary machine to track and analyze automobile traffic data. In 1973, Gates enrolled at Harvard, and studied there for two years. In 1974, Gary Kildall's operating system for microcomputers has already been recognized on the market and Gary promoted it through the digital research company. At that time, 19 years old Bill Gates was still a student at Harvard. A year later, in 1975, Bill funded Microsoft with his friend Alan. Microsoft, back then, was just a small startup company that had no operating system of its own. In 1994, in July, Gary Kildall died, and his death was a game-changer, a turning point in the history of personal computers. If Gary would be alive today, maybe there wouldn't be just one Microsoft, 
and maybe, with all the respect, to current Microsoft's exciting achievements, there would be more other players on the market, creating a healthy competition in digital operating systems, that in the end, are all connected to everything around us, in our today's life. An operating system is the clue to make things function, whether it is about any software and apps for computer or phone, or about machine learning platforms, or artificial intelligence neural network, Internet of Things, or Industrial Internet of Things solutions, or any other digital technologies, it is all based on operating systems. Even our human brain has its own biological operating system. Gary Kildall's first universal operating system for PC and its upgrades, was a genius crucial invention, a solid base for new technologies. It's important that we acknowledge that, and remember his name. Let your friends, know, his story.